Hello, welcome to the LaRouche Pack Weekly Report for December the 5th, 2012. I'm John Hofel, and joining me in the studio today are Matthew Ogden of LPAC TV, Megan Beats of The Basement, and Lyndon LaRouche. Yes. So, Lynn. Well, this is uh, a little note of explanation should be added in, in prefacing what we're about to do. That the objective here is not simply trying to screen music or trying to use a screen to explain music, mm -hmm. but rather it's trying to show something else, that there is a principle involved with Bach's perfection of the idea of tuning, which actually, when you compare it with other things besides contrary to Bach's, you find a mess on your hands. And this, what this reveals to us is the fact that there is a reason behind Bach's composition and his principles of composition which are displayed in this particular example which actually governs the way people should think about themselves, about life, and things in general. Because music is not simply entertainment. Classical music in particular is a composition which is, enables us to enrich the capabilities of the human mind. And the, the, the mastery of this is therefore relevant to all human beings, potentially at least, that the learning how to use your mind properly the way it was intended to be used is the purpose here. And if that, with that in mind, this is not just music. It's more than just music. It's the principle of the human mind. And uh, we hope that you will take away from this experience some inkling of that and also be devoted to, to uh, pursuing this matter further. Let me just add to what you said. We're going to be looking at Bach, but Bach also doesn't come out of nowhere. Bach comes out of a, a direct uh, continuity, a direct line that stems from the Renaissance with Nicholas of Cusa through Kepler up to Bach and then beyond. And we're going to start to touch a little bit on the beyond just today. What Cusa did is establish, as you're saying, that the location and the presence of the human mind in human mental experience, which is of the category of discovery and access to principle, he locates this outside of the senses and makes a truthful declaration of this as the basis of human society and human existence as opposed to every other species on the planet. Kepler applies what Cusa discovered and declared, applies it and validates it as the method for making discoveries of physical principles in science. Now, in the context and in the process of doing that, Kepler also opens the door for what we see in Bach, which is a complete revolution in the musical language. And the place he does that is in his discovery of universal gravitation by using the language of polyphonic harmonics to be able to locate the motions of the, different, the, the multitude of planets of the solar system as a single unified system. And answer the question, not, uh, answer the question why do we have these, this particular set of motions of the different planets moved by the sun and not some other set? Now, what comes out of this in... in is that Kepler actually changes the meaning of harmonics. And he takes the harmonic intervals, which exist in music and had been studied from the time of the Greeks, if not before, as mathematical values, as direct mathematical arithmetical proportions. And Kepler establishes a new set of harmonics which are not, or which are not fixed mathematical proportions. And if people look back at his work, what he finds in the harmonic ratios of the motions of the planets are not these arithmetical harmonies. They're slightly larger, they're slightly smaller, and they're changing. They're constantly adjusting and changing. So this means, number one, sound is not something which, and, and harmonic sound in particular, that language is not something which stems from arithmetic and mathematical values from the bottom up. It stems from the mind down. Because the place that these planetary harmonics originates from is the singleness of action and idea of the mover, of the sun. And every motion taking place in the solar system is, is not some point-to-point -point interaction. It's an expression of the unity of effect of the action of the sun. Now this opens the door, as I said, for Bach, who opens a complete revolution in music and the musical language and takes what had been declared by Cusa experienced and applied by Kepler and validated, what Bach begins to do by making this the basis of, of the musical language is he begins to generalize this principle 
as a, uh, he begins to make this a general method of human communication and human experience through music. Now, this was actually expressed very beautifully by uh, the first biographer of Bach, Nicholas Forkel, who was very close to the, working very closely with the Bach family. And his description of the way that Bach invented his harmonic intervals, or he describes it as Bach's harmonies, are that Bach never started from sound. And the, the typical method beforehand was to have either a melody or maybe a bass line, a melody in the bass voice, and then to harmonize point to point sounds over that, which would either sound good or maybe you have a pass to a dissonance and then you resolve to something which sounds harmonic again. The way Forkel describes it is that that's not the way Bach composed. The way Bach composed is by the creation of three, four, five, and, and sometimes more, independent voices, which were making, and he describes it with this beautiful image of independent personalities, which were equally well informed on the topic of discussion, and which interact and discuss with each other. And the, what's formed in between them, in the counterpoint of these different statements of an idea, is a unity. And that Bach's harmonies and method of composition comes out of this. Now, this was studied intensely by the people coming out of the culture of Bach. And we're, what we're going to start with is Mozart. Mozart, in 1782, I think it is, arrives in Vienna as a young man, 25, 26 years old. Now, Mozart's coming from a very musical family. He's already a, a, an established composer. He had been a child prodigy, very well known. Mozart, when he gets, arrives at Vienna, is brought into the salon of Baron von Sweeten who had been the ambassador at Potsdam in Berlin, had talked and known the, the king there, had known C.P.E. Bach, and had been collecting these manuscripts of Bach's works, particularly Bach's fugues, and then at this point bringing them back to Vienna, which was the center of musical culture in Europe at the time. And Mozart's invited into these Sunday salons once a week, where he had an intensive study of young musicians around Baron von Sweden, including Mozart and Haydn, who's a little older, of the fugues of Bach. And this revolutionizes Mozart's compositions. It, it, it puts him through a certain revolutionary experience of the mind, out of which you have a complete transformation in his own already beautiful compositions. So what he does, uh, what, one thing they do during these salons is they take the fugues from the well-tempered clavier, which we studied last week, mm -hmm. began to study last week. Mozart takes the principle which is implicit in Bach commented on by Forkel of the independence of the voices in counterpoint with one another. And he, act, he makes that explicit by setting the fugue, which had been, been written for keyboard, as a piece for a string quartet. And they use this in the salon as an object of experimentation and study to pull this apart and find out what is this principle in here. So uh, what I'd like to do is begin by, what, what I'd like to do as the, as the example to explore today is I want to use the same fugue that we used last week, which is the fugue in C minor from the second book of the Well-Tempered Clavier. So what I'll do now is just start by playing the very opening of the keyboard version of that so we can have it in our heads. Now what I'll play is I'll play, that, the, I'll play the theme that we just heard as it's sung by the violin, the voice of the violin. So that I'll play the violin, and then after that I'll play the cello. So we can now hear the transformation that happens by adding the dimensionalities of the string medium.
So now what's implicit in Bach's mind when he composes the keyboard is we, we literally have now different personalities, not only in the colors of the instruments, but also in the personalities and individuality of the different individual musicians mm -hmm. involved. Now, what I want to do is I want to get into what, begin to touch what are some of the characteristics of this musical language? What are the, what is the kind of mental experience which is accessible to Mozart, which he would have been studying with these fugues? So in order to do that, I'm actually going to start at the end. And um, what I'm going to play now, I'm going to play something which probably won't mean very much to you yet, but which will. <laughs> we're going to do now is I'm going to now, tr we're going to go back to the beginning and we're going to trace from that, from the beginning up through this point and hopefully this will actually mean something to you by the time we get, we return back to it in the future. Um, so let me just do this, let me just play the very beginning of the fugue with the strings and what, um, what people should listen for is, pe is people should listen for this theme that we've now heard a couple of times. You'll hear it first in the second violin, then the first violin, then the viola, then the cello. So just listen for how this, this statement of the theme is passed around to these different individuals and put into the mouths of the different characters of the dialogue. Obviously, hopefully the theme was audible as it was passed around, but that's obviously not all that was occurring. So now I want to look a little bit at what are the other elements that are, that are being put before us now. So if um, we can see in measure eight that we have the entrance, and I'll, I'll play this in a moment, we have the entrance of the theme again in the, upper, the first violin, the uppermost voice. And when I'll play it, you'll, you'll recognize it as the theme for the most part. It's a little bit changed, but it's recognizable. Now I'm going to play that with what it is placed in counterpoint with. So I'll play it one more time, and people should, what I want people to hear is that your ears are hearing the same notes as before and the same theme, but it's changed. Now some, it's, there's been something new introduced, and, and the meaning of it is now changed. The mind is hearing a different meaning now because of what it's placed in dialogue and counterpoint with. Alright, now it's, it's these two elements basically that I've pointed out. Number one, we have the, the exchange of the theme and the passing of the theme from personality to personality, which establishes a certain rate of change occurring as the process unfolds. We have this element, 
And then we have the other element of how that theme in itself is being changed inside the mind by this process of counterpoint, of its interaction with, with another idea and the resolution of that interaction in the mind. So what I'll play now is I'll play uh, the beginning up through uh, about the halfway point of the piece where Bach, using these elements, brings, brings the process to a first conclusion. Actually, we're not going to start at the beginning. We're going to start just a little bit before this and then bring it to its first conclusion. So you heard the last note, you have the, the conclusion of every, the everything closes and unifies and resolves on G. Yeah. In G, which is a, a fifth above where we started the key of C minor, which is the, the home base of the entire fugue. That's a first conclusion. But then Bach starts again, and we have a new beginning. So I'll just play that new beginning, and it's, what, what you'll hear right away is that we, we have a new, a new opening but there's something immediately different about it. So let's look a little bit at what's happening here. We have a, a first statement again, the first theme, just as the piece opened before, but now an octave higher, which is then immediately followed by another restatement of the theme in the viola voice, which is then followed by another restatement of the theme in the second violin, and then the first violin, and then the viola, and then the violin again. So what, I, what I'll play now is I'll play that separated out so that we can hear clearly this exchange which is happening of the theme. So I find this really delightful because all, with, as, suddenly in the retake of the theme, in the new beginning, we have a, a changed geometry where uh, the first two times you hear the theme, there's already a change. And we see this in the viola voice where the violin makes the theme statement, then the viola voice makes the theme statement, but in inversion, where rather than falling, the viola voice rises. So I'll just play that by itself. which is quite delightful because this is the only time that we actually hear the inversion of the theme until the very end, where it plays a crucial role. So now if we go back to, uh, to the, the four voices together, um, we, have the, uh, we have this exchange of the theme, which is happening, number one, at a faster rate than it happened before. But number two, already by the third measure, that quicker rate of, of action has now become even quicker. And so what we hear in the second violin, passed to the first violin, passed to the viola, and so on, is the theme, but it's only the first four notes of the theme. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll play that again so that people can hear it. What before was you know, something like eight notes, which took an entire measure, is now being passed around just in the first four notes of the theme. So 
So we have an acceleration of the action, an acceleration of the change at the same time that there's transformation occurring. But what he also, so, so we have a speeding up of the time, of the tempo. But at the same time, he also does, he also adds a stretching out of the tempo in counterpoint to all of that. So what I'll do is, um, you can see it if you go, yeah, the, the blue notes there in the second violin voice. So I'll play it and people should be able to hear what I'm talking about. Now, just a, a note on what he's doing in the, in the third and fourth and fifth measures here, where the theme has now been compressed to now just four notes. And it's, it's crucial to think about the fact that what your ears are hearing now are just these four notes. But what the mind is experiencing at that time is this whole, is the entire theme. And so the development process has gotten to a point where we actually require less sound to represent a more complex developing idea. And you're literally having the movement of the mind away from the experience of the ears and more and more to the kind of complex experience of the ideas above the sounds. So keep that in mind because this is what he, this is what, this point we've arrived at now is what Bach uses to develop up until the end. So we're going to go now to um, we're going to go now back toward the end. Those elements Bach uses to develop the composition to another resolution, and now he resolves it back into C minor, which is the the place we started from. But he doesn't quite leave it there. He has that conclusion, and then he has another, a third and final beginning of the piece. So I'll just play that. And uh, as, I, as I play it, what, I'm, what I'll point out here is that just as before we had the theme which was condensed or compressed in a sense mentally into these four notes now, now you have the wrapping up of everything that's come before into just two notes. And what you'll hear here, what, what I'll play um, separated out so that it's audible, is you'll hear this exchange of the first two notes of the theme passed from character to character. And so rather than an entire statement of the theme or four notes of the theme, now we have two notes or really just one descending interval. So I can play that one more time. So now what I'd like to play is I'd like to play, I don't know if, if it's recognizable or not, but what this part is, this is what I played in the beginning, which I said people wouldn't understand yet, but we would get to. So maybe some recognized it, some didn't. But what I'd like to do is now just play, uh, play the clip that I played at the very beginning, and, and you should be able to hear these things in it. Aha. Uh -huh. Now what did the cello do there? Because the, in this retake of the theme we have this is characterized by these descending, this descending interval. But the cello didn't do that. The cello did this. Mm -hmm. 
which is this wonderful intervention. So you have the intervention of the cello in what's really kind of a final, you know, a finalizing statement on the whole thing, which inverts everything. All the other voices had been entering on this descending interval. The cello enters on number one, the inversion, which we had heard before. And number two starts off with a rising half step. Now what Bach does is he takes this entire process that we've been going through, this, this wrapping up of the theme into these denser and denser intervals and denser and denser rate of change. Just a couple measures before this, he had wrapped it up into just two notes. Now already he's wrapping it up into one rising half step. And what I'm going to play now is I'm just going to play, I'll play the what the cello does here, and then I'll play the answer of all of the other voices to that, which comes just in the next measure. So I'll play that one more time. So what you hear is you hear this completely dense, compressed into one measure, series of these rising half steps, which now for the mind, the ears are hearing this completely dense series of, of two notes in these rising half steps. The mind is hearing this entire process of transformation. So now what I'd like to play is I'm just going to play where we started before, just a few measures before this, with this third beginning all the way up until the end. So, I mean, just a couple things I'll emphasize before I, I pass it off here is, number one, this method of composition is, is, is completely freeing the mind from the language of the senses and literal statements. And you literally have the creation in the mind of a process which the ears cannot literally participate in, but which we can actually feel is what's, what's above the, what, what can be unfolded to the senses and which is organizing and driving the ironies which can be presented via the senses in this process of the development of mind. Now you had, as I said before, you had Mozart, you had Haydn. Later you had the young Beethoven come to Vienna and participate in these salons and the study of the well-tempered clavier and the fugues of Bach. And so what we had at the, the end of the 18th century, the beginning of the ninth, and up through the, the, the 19th century, is we had an absolute continuity of geniuses who were taking the, the line of Cusa through Kepler and developing it as a general characteristic of human language and common human experience. And the significance of the medium of the string quartet is that not only are you, you having a solo player which is participating in this, but you're actually having this become a, a medium of communication among multiple human beings at once, being animated by a single process at once as a unity. Um, so, and this, I mean, this is carried on, and I would just emphasize that what, what you said in the beginning, Lynn, that this is not a question of, of music as music, as some branch of study, but we really are getting at uh, the development of the human mind, and you see that what was unleashed by Kuza was carried up to a certain point before it was attacked, and, and that's really, I think, where it, it's, it's crucial, it's existential that humanity is able to pick up that thread again today, given the challenges we face before us. I would say that where you look at, we'll see this, is when we look at Mars and the relationship of man's function with respect to Mars, because we, we will find that 
a, a cross-critical relationship between what we learn from Mars and what we experience on Earth. And this is going to teach us that with words and so forth and music are not simply arbitrary entertainments, but they, they correspond to universal functions. And what's happened with these kinds of development in music is that we've approached more closely exactly the common language or the root of a common language which can be extended beyond that point. And this, this now man can think in different terms. For example, when we go from Earth to Mars and think about the functions which are defined by introducing the Mars function against the Earth function, and you, you're in a completely different domain and you're doing the same thing that Bach does. And you have to appreciate that that's what's happening that you are, you are leaving the department of human behavior on Earth and you're going into man's interaction with a, a larger system, to Mars included, but also looking at all these rocks and flying around in, in space between Mars orbit and Venus orbit and all this junk that we have to deal with. And in this process, there is a reason. Everything has a reason in it. And that's what we're trying to get at. And so therefore, we're looking at the concept of not just music, we're looking at the concept of reason, of human creativity, the essence of human creativity. And that's, that's expressed here. That's expressed as a challenge. And the problem is mankind has to get out of the gobbledygook, which is what they seem to prefer these days, <laughs> and getting back into the challenge of what, what do we do? We're on Earth. We're accustomed to using an atmosphere and gravitation on Earth as, a, as the basis for functioning. But once we look at Mars, well, there's nobody on Mars right now, and there probably won't be for probably a generation or so, even at best terms, because we'll have to get to a higher order of organization uh, that before man can actually go on Mars. But in the meantime, we can use the radiation from Earth to Mars pick it up and use it, and now we can use, explore this area between the Mars orbit and the Venus orbit, where all these rocks and comets have come flying through and so forth. Mm -hmm. And now we can begin to try to find out what is the order in this area between the Mars orbit and the Venus orbit. What's the order there? And what does that have to do with the future of mankind? And this is what we're dealing with. We're dealing with actually with saying there is a language which is not just language of the way we define it, but there is an inherent language. And it's not just mathematics. It's something else, something more. And by our realizing that we are faced now as mankind with a threat to human existence mm -hmm. from the situation of these all these rocks these floating around out there threatening us, and comets coming in to zoom through if they, and hit us if they can, that we now realize that we have to go to a higher level of thinking than we've been using before, more critical. That all this thing has a common meaning, and we have to discover what it is. Well, and what Bach allows us to do is open up higher levels, uh, higher forms of communication, forms of communication that are beyond just spoken language. And the ability of the mind to penetrate into this uh, higher level of communication allows us to begin to understand, like the questions you're raising, how can the human species begin to exert control over the entire space between Mars and Venus orbit? And you think about it, mm -hmm. the sun does that. The sun communicates to the planets, uh, but it doesn't do that through words. It does it through principle. And the question that you begin to ask, and this is actually the question that Kepler asked and found his pathway towards his answer through music, uh, is how can mankind begin to exert, uh, I think, what's, what's been discussed as a uh, system of communication, command, and control over all of the material within that area of space between Earth and Mars, Venus and Mars orbit. Not only the array of our man-made instruments that we're communicating with uh, through, you know, radiative communications like Curiosity on Mars, but also begin to communicate our intentions to uh, the planets and the other material that's, that's in that range.
and begin to understand how does communication work from the standpoint of the sun, for example, and how can we exert command and control over this entire region of space? Well, first of all, we still human beings, presumably. Uh, when we get onto Mars without actually being there, but actually doing things and shipping things to Mars and so forth, we're changing Earth's relationship simply from that of the simple planetary, interplanetary relationship. We're actually having a functional change in, in relationship between two, two planets. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we start to in, introduce the complication of uh, rocks, asteroids, and comets flying by, you actually have made, de defined uh, your own awareness that is a function between Earth and Mars which you did, really didn't see, you didn't understand. And it's a function which has a practical importance, therefore you have to learn how to deal with it. So your mind is open to a completely new dimension of reality simply by taking this simple thing. Here we have the danger to human beings today is from asteroids and comets. They are becoming more active. I mean, the solar system has a finite life expectancy within probably two billion years from now before the whole sun blows up. So therefore, you're dealing with a finite process. This finite process is not simply a mechanical repetition process. This is an evolving process among planets and so forth. And it's going in a direction. And therefore, we, we now have find that in order to deal with uh, the challenge to our existence, we have to understand that direction. Now, trying to find it from Earth and looking at the sun is a fine idea. And you learn many things from it. But there are many things you don't learn from that. It's only when you get into the complexity of the great mass of detailed material, uh, you know, this had millions of this pieces of rock and so forth, and, and comets flying by. These things now are your complexity. Your life depends upon it. Human existence depends upon the ability to manage this stuff. And this, this is exactly the same kind of thing. This is exactly the same kind of concept. You need a science which is based on that, based on those kinds of challenges. And with, instead of being on Earth and looking at, a, at Mars as a spectacle, uh, mm -hmm. we're now looking at Mars as something that's very important to us, and we never understood how important that was before. Now somebody told us about those asteroids flying by and the comets are dangerous. Mm -hmm. And then we say, wait a minute, we're not on Earth. We're in a couple, which is not limited by the gravitation of the, of the solar system. We're now, our life depends upon our consciousness, our conscious solutions to threats we didn't know existed before. And that's, that state of mind corresponds to a mission. And, and Bach gives you a definition of a mission of that nature because it's relevant to that nature. And then you begin to say, well, maybe the way we do everything has to change. Maybe we have to take this into account all the time. And it's an amplification of man's role in the universe, in the solar system in particular. Well, this, is, this is the challenge. We, we've got to get people out of the stupidity compulsion of just saying this works, These are, let's be practical. Mm -hmm. and uh, People who become practical will eventually become dead, often prematurely, because they get too damn practical and don't see some of the things that they should be seeing, which will determine whether they live or not. Mm -hmm. Well, one thing we were uh, working with when uh, trying to prepare these examples with the string quartet, and it opens up the... Um, it opens up the challenges that uh, exist implicitly in the well-tempered clavier as performed on a keyboard, but exist uh, explicitly when you're dealing with uh, stringed instruments which have variable tunings. How do you begin to create a situation of internal communication, which is a constantly changing, constantly dynamic communication within the tempering and the tuning of the string quartet? Tension, increased tension. Accepting increased tension is part of a process which is more complex than you assumed in the first place. You get this, for example, in musical performances by some great conductors. One of the, my favorites for this purpose is the Ninth Symphony of Schubert, Schubert mm. which is done by uh, Fred Wengler's yeah, performance. This is, this is a highly revealing 
thing. And all you have to do is, is think about Schubert and Schubert, who, his relationship to some other things that happened afterwards, uh, uh, like as this case. Then you look at Schubert again in terms of the Ninth Symphony. Mm -hmm. And you, you go through an experience, your view of things changes. And Furt Wengler's role in that, in that performance, that, I, that gripped me. It, it's gripped me. It keeps gripping me. I keep going back to it. It's, it's, a, it's a very specific thing. It's not just the Schubert symphony. It's Furtwängler presenting an actual understanding, yeah. and just like this. It's the same thing, exactly that. This is the primitive expression of it. So that's the exact what you want to get, and that is what we have to be able to do and think in terms of this when we try to deal with the challenge to the planets, the challenge of the asteroids, which th threaten life on Earth, the challenge of the comets. This is exactly the kind of change, a new, a new situation, a new challenge. Mm. And you realize it was there all along. And you suddenly be, are activated. And that's what you get with the great, great performances in, in music, is exactly that. What's the difference between one performer and another? If they're all more or less valid, uh, someone sees a little bit more than the next one does. The, um, in some of uh, Furtwängler's private notebooks where he's taking notes, he describes the uh, phenomenon of the orchestra, which at his time could consist of anywhere between 70 and even 100 different players, different heads, different hands, different instruments playing all at once. But he says, what can pull all of these separate individuals together to express one soul, one idea, one intention and and uh, and and pulls them in together into a single organism almost and uh, you know as in the case of the string quartet that's sort of this distilled as you said primitive uh, form of being able to take that to an even higher level with what Furt Wengler accomplished yes. with the full orchestra exactly. yeah well that's what Norbert really achieved with the string quartet mm -hmm. and with other things as well exactly that no, it's just it, also, it also calls into question of what do you mean when you say I or the individual. I mean, the tendency today is to, lo is to locate your identity and, and locate yourself in the body, which also means within the existence of the body, which has these, this birth and this death. But you have this experience of the orchestra, the experience of the string quartet, and then what you're calling for right now, which is this, this establishment of the human species as existing on Mars and Earth, and Venus and other places at the same time, it, it, abs it, it forces the identity of the individual to rise above what is assumed by some kind of observation of the biological existence. It goes to the very simple kind of question. Now, animals and humans, difference. The human mind is, is capable because the human mind locates its identity in what is a certain kind of immortality. That the, it's not a question of the uh, new individual being born to replace the ones who are dying. It's not that. It's a process of development which it contains all these processes which the individual life are composed of. And it's when mankind loses that sense of connection which is specific to mankind's consciousness of the world around him. Huh? that when they lose that, then they lose their humanity. And that is precisely what has happened to society in recent times, particularly over the recent generations, I mean, since the time that, uh, you know, the death, uh, the murder of uh, some great presidents, uh, like Kennedy. Mm -hmm. uh, and what you said, you had, a, you had a killing off of a process. Where Truman did some of the killing off from Roosevelt. And then you had the, the, the murder of Kennedy and his brother. That also caused a permanent change in the direction of society, a permanent change downward. And, and so the, the, what, a sense of cohesion, mm -hmm. a sense of comradeship and so forth, that sort of thing, that there's a continuity and the individual, rather than being a phenomenon which has a beginning and end, is a part of a process which goes on indefinitely. And the objective is, is to go through a century, which is essentially four generations nowadays, uh, or used, what has been recently until things got worse more recently. And it, therefore you have a sense of mankind 
that the each each succession in the, gen, in the generation process is carrying forth development of, of mankind. And therefore, there's a common mission, and the birth and death of the individual in the process is of the secondary significance. Mm -hmm. The primary significance is the immortality of the succession when the, the function of progress is, is there. And therefore, you know, that's... He, it, that it's a change now to the I'm an individual, I do my thing, uh, and I, they do it too much. But, <laughs> right? but it's, it, that's where the process, we, we're, we've lost the sense because of this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. We've lost the sense, which is the basis of classical musical composition, and that is that there's a continuity, and you see this in the attempts to performance by great conductors and musicians. They're, they're doing the same thing, but they're not. They're progressing. They're constantly progressing, discovering a new aspect of something they didn't see before. Mm -hmm. So there's a continuity. You have it like the composers, the histories of composers, the, the progress defined by the history of the great classical composers. Right. So that the, the, that's the... And this, this spanned a century or two. Mm -hmm. So the, the idea of a multi-century process of development of the, of the human species... As, the, as an immortal species composed of mortal individuals. Well, also in terms of uh, broken continuities, I mean, what we're emphasizing now with what Andrew Jackson did to the continuity of the mission of the American Republic, uh, not only did he uh, break the commitment to the original idea of the founders, but also the idea of a sense of a unified nation, a nation as a unity, was broken, and he began through party, sectionalism, factionation, to separate the sense of common shared mission into all of these individual parts, leading eventually to the Civil War. Well, this is called bestialization. Right. Because instead of saying a continuity of humanity, which and humanity as being a mission of self-development of mankind, you now say, well, anything goes. It's popular opinion that decides everything. Mm -hmm. And therefore, uh, any rumpus room can be a, a, a government. <laughs> and what you have is all these guys voting, as, as citizens supposedly, voting for election of office. Mm -hmm. um, and they say that they, the one that got the most votes is the one who should rule. Well, that's nonsense. Because there has to be a standard, which is a higher standard of principle, which tells you who is a, a faker and who is not, and whose ideas are, are fake and who are not. Right. But the point is now they say, no, there is no such thing. There is no such order. Everybody can make up their own mind. And therefore, since there is no principle except what everybody chooses to make up their, make their mind at that time with no criteria, no criterion whatsoever. And therefore, the, that was the use of popular opinion, which the British had learned how to use. It's like the Roman Empire, the same thing. Mm -hmm. Roman Empire the Colosseum, up, down. Mm -hmm. What's the reason? None. No reason. Motives, yes. Reason, no. And that's what's happened to us. And that's what we're seeing with this right now. We're seeing absolute, absolute in unreason. No reason whatsoever. That's the that's him. That's our Andrew Jackson. Hmm? No, there is no reason for Jackson's existence. Hmm? And there's no reason to miss him or to regret his passing. He's just garbage that was left on the streets and somebody has to clean it up. <laughs> and that is essentially is what has just happened when the election campaign just closed. There was no reason... It was just garbage, but the problem is the garbage hasn't been cleaned up. It's man's, it's man's sense of, of participation in an immortal purpose. And that is truth. That is justice. And when you have no justice but just idle opinion, the idle opinion of an insane mob, and that's what we've lost. We gave into it. And that's what Jackson epitomizes. 
It's, and it's a, it's a fight, but I think if we can understand better from the cross relationship among some of these factors of in human existence and, and you know solar system existence and so forth, we can deal with the problem. But we we have to establish a an idea of a special kind of rationality which must be used by mankind, which mankind must consult to make decisions. And it's like the progress of music. It must progress. And that's the only law. It must progress. It must do more. It must do better. Each generation must do better. We've, got, we've run over run Earth. Well, we're going to go into Mars now. Go beyond that and beyond that. The sun's going to get blown up, so what? We'll be gone by that time. We'll be doing, living someplace else. It's fun. But that's the whole point. There's no, there is no accepted morally competent criteria mm -hmm. for human behavior in this society now. All the voters are insane. Even if they have individually sane behavior in, in, on this and that and so forth, the whole system has no saint, no sanity to it. And what you had is this election, and the two Bushes beforehand and Daddy Bush before that were all rubbish. What they represent is insanity. Forget, forget who is right and who is wrong on particular issues. That's not the point. The question is sanity, human sanity. Is that the thing that's controlling? Are we improving our ability to t learn what the truth is? Mm -hmm not whether you'd happen to know it at one time or another. Mm. Yeah. Ah. And one of the most intense experiences of being human, too, is being able to live Bach's immortality. Yeah. You imagine Mozart there uh, inside Bach's mind, rediscovering this and incorporating it into himself. I think he was there. Yeah. <laughs> I think the evidence is pretty clear. Yes. <laughs> Now, the problem is to get people to understand themselves, from a, not from this ego trip, I'm saying, but person, look inside themselves in terms of a successive generations of mankind, a mankind defined by a mission, a, a human mission, from generation to generation. And that's, like, that's what's lacking. There is no real morality. People say, I have a code, and they call it morality. But it, the code doesn't function. Look what they vote for. Means that the code is not functioning. The standard of what truth is and justice is is not functioning. Yeah, I think people have to really see that this has been taken away from civilization intentionally. It's been this kind of condition has been imposed upon civilization artificially by brute force throughout history. And I think we really need to fight to, to get people access to the fact that this perpetual progress you're discussing is our birthright. It's just this, this is exactly it. The Andrew the Jackson. Jackson case mm -hmm. defines it all. Absolutely. That the evil that Andrew Jackson has always represented, but merely represented, mm -hmm. because he was only a tool of that evil. And that, that, that is what's wrong with the United States. What's wrong then was wrong then, which was not a, dealt with properly before, and afterward, that's the assassinations of our greatest leaders, and typifies that. No, this this is a, a struggle we have to we have to accept, and you cannot compromise with it. it just a compromise is, is inherently evil because it means irrationalism. Mm -hmm. and that's what compromise usually means: irrationalism. And that is not a good recipe. Now, this, but to get, if we can get people to begin to realize that the idea of classical musical composition, as it was, the, as the relationships were attested here today, right now with, the, with this meeting, that is what's needed. That that is the standard of morality. That. And they've got to learn. They've got to take up the subject and learn what this is all about. What does this have to do with the succession of generations of human beings? Now, I'm satisfied that we've got the right track, but I'm not sure that we've got all the people running on the right tracks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
It's a beautiful subject. Yeah. Mm. Have to do more of it. But to really understand it. Yeah. Ah. Mm. Good. My little dog is going to bite me. <laughs> Whenever she doesn't like something, she says, she like, likes to get you by the foot or something and bite. And that's her communication. <laughs> that's her voice. Yes. <laughs> the dog says, well, we're going to the dogs again. I'm biting. <laughs> there are a lot of people that communicate that way, too. Yes, I know. <laughs> yes, I'm dogged determination. <laughs> All right, well, that will do it for this week. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week.